Between Starfighters, welcome to Mad Science Films. I'm Jimmy P, filmmaker and sexual astronaut. First up, guys, please check out our fourth feature film for free. Now on YouTube, just search for Little Monster or click on the link in the show notes below. This episode, I'm joined by a very special guest, a guy I've known for, I don't know, eight, nine years, probably. Uh, director of the animated web series, The Veil. And coming soon, or probably out by the time this goes live, to the BBC, the Golden Cobra, Mr. Adam Clewellyn. Welcome, Adam. Pack your swimming song, because this episode we're going to do a deep dive into making your own animated series. Um, I've been lucky enough, I saw The Veil online uh, for series one, and also had the pleasure of seeing it with an audience on the big screen, where, yeah, it got plenty of laughs and some sick, astonished gasps as well. Uh, I think that was episode one of season two, so uh, definitely check out The Veil, and again, we'll we'll drop uh, links in the show notes below. Uh, And, uh, Adam, I mean this in the best possible way. But I was pleasantly shocked that the BBC commissioned you for a show after seeing The Veil. So, you know, that gives me a bit of hope for all of us um, and also for the future of the BBC as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We need, well, the, the BBC needs more uh, snake shitting out dogs. I'll put that out right now. <laughs> so. Okay. I mean, I, I love the fact that somebody, you know, saw that episode and said, that's what we need more of. So Adam, like to, to put it into context, like when we first met uh, going back a while ago, um, I knew you, you were a live action uh, director, uh, shorts and, and series as well, such as Bernard and Knives. So what kind of inspired you from going from live action into animation? Um, it's kind of like a bit of a, it's, it's a bit of a, it's a bit of a, well, rocky road, really. I mean, um, so obviously Bernard and Knives was a web series we did back in, I just finished uni and it took us about three years to make it. I think I started shooting it in like 2011 and then it came out in like 2013, maybe 2014, that sort of time. Um, then after that, we went on to do, I think when we were talking, I was just about to start a feature project for a film called Big Girl, if you yeah. remember. Yeah, I remember. And, um, Love the yeah, script. You know, Love the script. Yeah, yeah. We uh, we shot a big chunk of it and stuff. Well, most of it actually there, but it just kind of like, it's just sort of how it goes with live action sometimes. It kind of just didn't really go anywhere it, like it's just kind of no budget filmmaking right I mean you've either got it or you don't and um it was just one of those things where like the cast we had were great the crew were all awesome and stuff but it just we just couldn't raise money to like um do the post-production side of things of it and, and, and finish it off basically there so it just kind of like kind of just kind of ended up being abandoned sadly hopefully one day we'd be able to pick it back up and get it out there for people to see but uh for now it's just sort of sitting on a hard drive somewhere really just in so was that was that a, f- a feature a feature length project yeah it was it was a feature project yeah we, we wow. shot like about a good 80 90 percent of it there um over like the span of two years yeah. and it just kind of like it was just one of those it was like a no budget bit over ambitious as well for the first project i i must admit but you know it's, it's how it goes isn't it and um but just and then when it when it kind of came to the point where it was a bit like Oh, because I made it with Thomas Reese. Uh, me and him wrote and directed it together. Yeah. It just kind of hit that point then when I was, you know, it was a bit depressing, kind of went nowhere. So I went back to university to, um, to to go back into teaching and I became a teacher for a couple of years. And then one day I was just bored and I made the first episode of The Veil. That's literally how it all happened. I was just in the house bored and I was just messing around on Photoshop because I was teaching a class on Photoshop. And I just realized that if you draw on two layers and you can make something move like a little animation and that's how the veil started that's literally how it started it was a it was on um it was like Easter holidays or half term when it all came together with the one of the characters anthony or, or tony as he doesn't like to be called for me personally as an anime fan from the 90s i felt very very seen was there an autobiographical element to the show with with that oh. character and, and with the surrounding characters I used to deny it, like, fervorously deny that I was based on Tony or Tony was based on myself. But it is, of course, yeah. It is, it is, it is, Tony is definitely me when I was 16, 17, 100%. And, uh, and also, um, it, it kind of comes from two things, really. So um, when I started making The Veil, I was teaching, um, I was sort of, I was teaching sort of part-time on a, um, a media course in Ebervale. And uh, there was, a, I remember the first time I went into the class, it was a game design class, um, video game design class I went into, and they were all anime fans. And I was just like, yeah, I'm going to I'm gonna be the cool teacher and talk to these guys about anime. But they were all into new stuff. And I, all I knew was like Akira, Ghost in the Shell, 
yeah. AD police, all the 90s stuff, but they were like, they didn't care about that. That was all, <laughs> they only cared about Attack on Titan and stuff, which I know nothing about. Yeah. So I, I just felt really old. And uh, But but like, some of, I just saw a bit of myself back when I was 17 and some of the kids there. And um, one day when I was there, they, one of the kids, I'm not going to say his name, but one of the kids there, his, it must have been his stepfather or maybe his actual father came to the college to pick him up. And I kind of saw them and his father was just a, his father was just beaten. He was like, you know, what are you doing, man? I would just all, all like that to him. And I just did that impression for weeks to my friends. I was like, I just found it really funny the way they interacted together. And that's sort of how yeah. Tony Beaton. Yeah, I, and beaten. I'm guessing it inspired that scene, yeah, where, where he picks up uh, Anthony in front of his friends. Yeah, standout scene. And, and yeah, yeah, it felt very kind of lived in. It felt very <laughs> genuine. Um, amazing. So with The Veil and obviously with your new show, Golden, Golden Cobra, were there any other shows that kind of inspired it alongside, obviously, the, the real life element? Oh, 100%, yeah. I mean, like, especially big things like King of the Hill. Um, King of the Hill is like a big, Mike Judge in general, really, a uh, huge inspiration on, on myself there. But also like um, just films in general and stuff. If you, if you watch the veil and stuff you'll probably notice a few times there's like just random film references in there sometimes like um i, I chuck in a couple of john carpenter references sometimes and stuff and um yeah it's just, it's just influence from everybody but mainly king of the hill mike judge definitely simpsons and south park that sort of stuff 100 yeah. yeah yeah good stuff good stuff yeah i i yeah i'm glad you said king of the hill because yeah definitely with kind of the the group of characters in that and the group of characters especially you know like yeah beaten and his friends that just felt very yeah, the Welsh version of King of the Hill, and oh. yeah, absolutely loved it. <laughs> but like, also as well, like a big, a big, a bit of a shout out to comics. Some comics I used to read. I don't really read comics anymore, but uh, when I was about 16, 17, I used to read a lot of comic books. And um, have you heard of like Daniel Close? He did Ghost World yeah. and yeah, all that yeah. stuff. Yeah. There was there was another guy from the same publisher called Fantagraphics called mm-hmm. Pete Bag. Yeah, and, um, he made a, he used to do a series called The Bradleys, which then became Hate. But, I, I know of it as hate. I, I I wasn't aware that yeah that it was it was something else beforehand. Yeah, yeah. it was the, well. It was it's weird. The hate is like a second series to the Bradleys, but oh, okay. you can you can pick you can pick up hate any time. It doesn't really matter. But inspired, I've always been inspired by that because it was a comic book series where the characters kind of aged, mm. like you know what I mean. It was like a sort of co- comedic comic yeah. series where the characters aged and growed, mm. uh, and you know throughout it there. So I've always I kind of really inspired like in the veil like try to make characters age yeah and yeah. that's why it has a bit of a story arc it's all just like if i've had that sort of idea for years about just wouldn't it be cool to do an animated show where you know yeah so it, kind of the, 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 the anti-simpsons where they're they're you know for 40 years or whatever they're actually <laughs> the ages they've been yeah oh, and, and, and like I, I remember reading king mike judge wanted to do have the king of the hill as well but fox wouldn't let him do it they were like he wanted to like have it so bobby went through his teenage years and stuff and then you know hank uh, hank went into you know further into being middle-aged but yeah fox wouldn't let him do it because the syndication which i always found quite sad but That's um just bizarre yeah you would have thought there would have been just so much more material they could have plundered by yeah having especially bobby yeah kind of go through that really yeah. awkward puberty and everything else definitely yeah well, like mark in the middle and friends and stuff do it. i mean they they enter their 40s and friends and stuff and they become 30 and all that and yeah. why can't cartoons do it but um this is how it is isn't it yeah, awesome. So yeah, we're we're fully expecting then at least thirty or forty series of of the Veil. Then yeah. <laughs> well, well, I've I've been telling people this is the last series series three, but um, who knows? I mean, there's, I, I I you can't really let go of Beaton and Tony. There's there's loads of stuff you can do with them there, but um, definitely gonna have a bit of a break after series three. Very much in terms of basing this on the, on the credits. So the concept that was uh, came up with by yourself, but I noticed then in terms of the yep. writing credit, that's kind of shared with the the other voice actors. Is is that about right? So is it a team effort writing it, or is it is it like you know pretty much concept by you and then dialogue written by the team? It's a mix of both really. So like um, so I Veil is like my creation. So I come up with the characters and um, you know come up with the story and stuff. <laughs> And um, you know, I'm obviously I'm the, I, I serve as like the main writer on the series there, but uh, but it's kind of like it is a collaboration, hundred percent. Yeah. So um, series one started off with the first episode of series one, which is written by myself. It's just 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 myself. I think like Ian that used to voice on there did a couple come up with um, he, he might have come up with the odd little joke, and he's got like an additional material credit there. But then see, episode two, I brought James Prigodich along as well. 
-hmm. and um we used to started sitting down in a room and we used to handwrite the first the first like three or four episodes of the veil were just handwritten they were like right. we would write the uh, we would write the dialogue right then and there on paper and then do the voices and then i would just go and draw it that's how the first but then when we got to episode i think it was after episode three we were a bit like wait a minute we should think think of this a bit we should think of this a bit more deeply and try and like you know kind of give them like a little path kind of create a pathway for like a, like a little story arc sort of thing yeah and then yeah. ben ballinger came on board steve ballinger and then that's when we started to like the four of us would sit down in a room and just kind of write the scenes out basically so um I'm giving you a really long-winded answer here, but um, in short, oh, it's good. Yeah. I usually uh, the story plots to kind of come up with myself, and then the five of us sit in a room and we just kind of go over each scene and kind of think what could be funnier, what, what's the best jokes we could do here, and we just kind of go over it like that. Then I'll go off and write the script, and then we'll sit down again and we'll go over that script and be like, let's think of funnier jokes, and it just kind of goes through about three or four, five drafts like that. Then basically, and uh, and then we do the voices. Sort of how it goes. So after after you've kind of locked it, so you're saying four or five drafts in terms of the script. After you've you've locked it, when you then come to recording it, does is it potentially another draft in terms of is there a bit of improv? Is there you know does anything happen beyond the script there once you're actually physically recording? Uh, yeah, usually we stick to the lines. Um, a lot of times we just stick to the dialogue as it's written, hundred percent usually. But sometimes we do like um. Sometimes we do like veer off and come up with like like um, Coach Nails, the um, the PE teacher that's always threatening to bum the students. That that was come up on the spot, like because we just had an angry PE teacher, and um, I drew I drew him, and uh, we and James were recording the voices, and it just it was just falling flat. And then he just randomly said, "I'll bum the lot of you," and we just thought that was really funny. And then the character just became this sort of rugby teacher that threatens <laughs> the kids with a bumming all the time. And I, I was never going to talk about that. Universal, I, I think it must be a universal, like, personal specification for PE teachers, like, across the <laughs> thing, because we've all got uh, them. I mean, I don't know if my, my personal PE teacher is still alive, but he, yeah. yeah. I absolutely kind of sympathize with that because yeah, there was always the threat of sexual violence to all of us if any of us stepped out of line. So it, yeah, it's a universal kind of uh, experience got obviously growing up, but uh, yeah, that was fantastic. And it's great to hear that, that that was something that kind of, yeah, came up while recording the dialogue as well. So, oh, yeah. well, well, sorry, man. go on. I was just gonna say, well, well, James, James used to be a rugby player. Um, the, the, he used to be on a rugby team, so maybe that he came up with that on the spot. So maybe he's got some dark backstory there he's not telling me about. So you know, yeah, yeah, hey, yeah. <laughs> just ask the class of two thousand two, definitely. Yeah. So, I mean, you, you kind of answered it. So, like, it was only partway through season one that you kind of decided to start thinking out, like, planning it slightly more seriously. Um, do you, when you sit down, have like a story arcs m marked out for like the whole season, like at the beginning of each series? Then, like, obviously, I guess starting from two onwards, yeah. or Fantastic. yeah, basically, yeah. I mean, like, okay, it's just series. The, the joke of series one is a bit, it, it changed as we went on, but I, I remember like when I when we did the first, it was never supposed to be a series, basically. <laughs> it's weird how it came about. So, the first episode was just supposed to be a little short film yeah. where like this, the joke, the joke was this. Tony wants to go to an anime convention. His dad says, no, you have to, his stepdad says, you have to come to the Anton trip with me. And it was supposed to end there. And it was made as a little short film, just, you know, for my own amusement and, you know, my friends, because I used to do the voice of Beaton all the time. Yeah. And then, and then <laughs> the other bit in episode two where he farts on Tony, like I animated that for a joke one day. And, and I live with James, me and James, we're housemates. We live in a house here together. And um, at the time, Ian lived with us as well. And we just kept watching that bit when he farted on him all the time because we thought that, and it wasn't going to go on YouTube or anything. And that's how it came about. And then at that moment, I was a bit like, oh, what if we do a little series where they go on a hunting trip together and then Tony tries to kill his stepdad. And that's the, so we just had that, we had that through line going on. Yeah, yeah. And then series two, I, I said, okay, in this series, Beaton and Tony are friends now after the end of series one, but he fancies Kate, he's going to have a fight with her boyfriend by the end of it. And you, you have that vague sort of story arc, and then yeah. you just build around that, basically. It's fantastic. And I, lo I love the idea that, yeah, you kind of had written uh, episode one just as its own self-contained story. But, I mean, like... Yeah, there's so much stuff there which does pay off later on. So that's that's absolutely amazing, you know, how you kind of like 
almost hard baked it <laughs> into a lot of that's accidental like a lot of that stuff's really accidental like oh thank god we did oh it's just us when we when we're sitting down to write stuff yeah. it's just a bit like we've, we've, we're stuck on something and we're like oh wait a minute we could just go back and pretend this was foreshadowed <laughs> just like yeah. build something off that but another thing as well the, the original end of the series one was way different as well well not way different but after the um, spoilers if no one's seen it there but um after Tony shoots his stepdad and it turns out to be an air gun, the original ending was, it was a hard cut to Tony in his bedroom with all of the posters stripped off his wall. And then he looks out the window and Beaton's just stood there with a bin outside burning all his anime stuff. <laughs> but that was the original ending. And that was the ending for ages. But then it, it was just making the series. We were a bit like, actually, like, um, you know, you, you kind of feel a bit like, that's, you know, you kind of like, oh, that's a bit of a bleak ending. Wouldn't it be nice if you give him a bit of a happy yeah. ending so you could... And it goes back to that King of the Hill on characters growing and stuff like, oh, Ben Beaton and Tony could be friends by series two. Definitely. Just... I mean, I think, yeah, the, the way you've described it is, yeah, the original ending would have been a great gag, but kind of would yeah. have stunted any growth. Whereas, yeah, you kind of love the fact that they they try and make up at the end and, you know, he, he unties them and they have a beer together. Absolutely love the fact that yeah. I, I, it, it, it's a big part of why I think shows like Friends and Spaced worked well, was it appeals to like, all, all parts of the audience, like especially with Spaced, like me and my wife watched that as it was coming out. Um, I was pretty much digging it for, yeah. the, for the movie references and my wife was digging it for the will they, won't they aspect of the show. Um, and I think, yeah, you, you, what you've done very smart and, and making that decision for the season one finale is, yeah, you know, you've kind of, again, yeah, given the characters room to grow and, you know, where's their relationship going in season two, rather than doing the typical sitcom thing of like resetting it each episode so the characters are exactly where they are you know the simpsons thing again i suppose is what we're saying yeah oh brilliant yeah i love it yeah and i, and I, I love i love loads of shows that you know press that reset button every like i love south park i watch south park all the time and um sim i love the simpsons and family guy and stuff but like you know it's just yeah it's just it's just something i thought was pretty cool really like you know it's just um, one of the things. I, I think that's the thing, isn't it? Like, as a creator, you've got to do something that keeps yourself passionate and interesting. And if this is, you know, not the well-trodden path, then then great, that's more likely to, you know, just the sheer amount of time that, you know, you spend on a project. If you're doing something that's slightly different that you can get passionate about, then, yeah, that, that holds your interest much longer. That's how The Veil started. So I'm guessing The Golden Copra wasn't handwritten scripts? <laughs> well, The Golden Copra was an idea... I, we had for a while so um the idea was the, the so the golden cobra is like a like a see would be a series about um a comedy series about basically a takeaway um the worst takeaway in Ebervale, which is based in a real place i'm not going to say the name of the actual place um it's based in a real place in Ebervale, um which is just infamous because they used to and um, it's just an infamous place in Ebervale, and um especially but go, mainly going back to like the early 2000s late 90s and there but I remember when I was a kid, um, my grandfather would just tell me horror stories about about the place, and like they had like an owner that would, the the owner would just be outside with a big vat of curry, stirring it with a cricket bat and stuff, and they had rats and stuff there, and it was just howling. And I just had the idea for the ages, like, oh, wouldn't it be cool to like? I've never seen a sitcom about like a really crappy rundown takeaway yeah. before, yeah, yeah. and then and also um, and um, just just fall and then and in the show following like um a sort of takeaway driver that works there and just a really humdrum story, if you will, basically. Mm. And um, yeah, and then basically uh, well, in the middle of series two of The Veil, like BBC got in touch with us and were like, um, hey, um, do you have any ideas you'd ever think about, um, you know, pitching to us? And I sent um, I sent them the, uh, the already sort of written outline for The Golden Cobra, which had a different title at the time. It was named after the real takeaway, which I'm not going to mention. <laughs> and um, and uh, which was a bit, bit, you know, bit, bit short sighted of me, I bet, I guess. But uh, and they, they really liked it, and it just kind of it went from there, basically. That was at the beginning of lockdown, mm. all that happened there. So um, the into all of lockdown, I was just silently working on this BBC project and keeping it quiet. That's amazing, absolutely fantastic. So again, then um, with the Golden Cobra, is it solely scripted by you, or again, is there a team of people writing it? Uh, it was me and James, me and James Brigadich that brought that together. Um, the, so we, um, so um, the idea was just kind of in the back of my mind for, for many years. But but James sat down and kind of, you know, helped you know develop it and bring it. So it's kind of it is our both of our creation basically there because you know we we came up with the characters together and stuff and we wrote the first episode together. Um, 
so yeah, and that's and we just, and we made sure it's all set in the same universe as the Vale. Oh, right. When you walk, when it comes, this this character is a couple of cameos from other characters Fantastic. in the Vale in there as well. You just see him walking around in the background there, but um, it's it's yeah, and hopefully if it, if it was to go to series, if uh, if everyone we get if everyone makes sure to watch it on iPlayer and we get a good rating, I guess a good ratings, I guess, um, and it goes to a full series there. Um, the plan would be to kind of hopefully. Uh, bring an extra, bring maybe bring an extra couple of ale writers on board, and uh, yeah, and um, just take it from there basically, and try fantastic. and just make it something set in the uh, make it something set in the Eberville universe. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah, have you, have you got a name for it then? It's the the Eber universe, is it Eber universe? I I, I I I call it the EVU to the boys. I'm always I always call it the EVU. <laughs> they, they, just, but I am just I'm pretty joking around. I'm just being like. You know, it's just I'm always like, yeah, the EVU. But, um... So, so what can people do to to kind of obviously help the um, the Golden Cobra become a show? Then, it, watching it on iPlayer is that is that the best easiest yeah. way? Yeah, get it on get it on iPlayer. Um, just watch it on iPlayer. Share it amongst your friends on online, and um, yeah, just 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 do that. Basically, just that's, that's what you could do. Um, you know. Just all rally outside the BBC building with a big placard saying "Give Golden Cobra a full series." If you want to do that. Feel free, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, six seasons in a movie. A lot. Yeah. No, six, yeah, go outside. Big, big banner saying six series in a movie, and just yeah. um, you know, just all stand outside the BBC building, going. Great. We won the yeah. There we go. Uh, we'll post, uh, yeah, links to where where the studio is and the, the postcode and, and and all of that. Um, <laughs> and, and I'm sure Adam will design some placards for for everybody as well, which we will we'll do as a, a Dropbox I'll, download I'll link. I'll be at the front of that protest, believe me. Awesome. <laughs>